Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It's Thursday, June 11th, 2020. I'm Michael Brooks on a Michael Thursday. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting multiple and different kinds of steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA, on today's program, Alexandria Neeson, writer for, among other publications, the Columbia Journalism Review, we're discussing her piece from 2019, Officials Say, in Chicago and elsewhere, police departments plant misinformation to the press We're talking about this relationship between policing, police abuses, and the press in light of this ongoing story, but also the fact that the police have chosen to viciously attack multiple members of the press over the past, over a week of demonstrations across the United States. Jobless claims, another 1.5 uh, million Americans file for unemployment benefits. The Federal Reserve is predicting a slow recovery with unemployment at 9.3% at the end of 2020. And macroeconomic moves in response, even as... Nothing has been done on rent freezes or additional direct funding to people. Corona infections climb even as Washington moves on to other business. And state governors are rejecting new lockdown measures as the virus spikes. The mayor of Washington, D.C., excited to co-opt and brand the movement with Black Lives Matter Plaza, of course, is not considering anything to do with refunding and redeploying revenue in Washington, D.C. New video of a 2019 incident. Black man in Oklahoma telling two officers he can't breathe. One said he didn't care. The other said, I don't believe you. And he died. Jefferson Davis statue is torn down in Westman, Virginia, as Christopher Columbus statues come down as well. Louisville police finally released a report on the murder of Breonna Taylor, and the incident is essentially empty, as reported by the police. Congress is poised to get its first QAnon believer. A man who claimed that George Floyd and Derek Chauvin bumped heads changes story. And Joe Biden, he hears you loud and clear. Technical fixes, nothing systemic on the economy, and more money for police departments. Never fear. Joe Biden is... Absolutely listening. Trump campaign freaking out as poll numbers look really bad in swing states like Michigan, where Joe Biden has opened up a double digit lead. Shut up. I'm getting a new polling company. IBM has banned the facial uh, recognition, so- has uh, ended a facial recognition software division. Good news, not for altruistic reasons, they were losing money. Amazon bans police use of facial recognition technology for one year. Hmm. 
Until we can figure out what the hell's going yeah. on. Until we can figure out what the hell is going on. LeBron James pushing forward a new fighting for black uh, voting rights with more than one vote initiative as the Republican war on voting rights intensifies. And ICE plans to spend $18 million on thousands of new tasers. All that and much, much more on today's Majority Report. Brendan, Matt, how are you guys doing? What's the good word? Uh, maintaining, I think I would say. Maintaining. Yep. Um, it's, it, I definitely, especially last week, you know, going out to some of the protests and stuff, I, I feel like in the last day or two, I've sort of officially reminded myself that we're still in the middle of a pandemic. I think I got, uh, I it's don't want to say strange. complacent, but it, it was not, you know, for the first time in a couple of months, it was, it was not the last thing in my mind, but absolutely not at the forefront. Oh <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Not even remotely. Now it's yeah. coming back a bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess it makes sense because uh, cases are surging, obviously. Um, next phase of what happens out of these incredible uprisings across the country, um, which you talked about extensively, uh, from the federal response to the Democrats, the federal response to the Republicans, the various uh, arguments, approaches, and strategies at the local level, um, rebuilding uh, areas, and this is something that we're going to need to, you know, also cover uh, very closely. There's a lot of reports, particularly in places like Minneapolis, of police looking on um, when local businesses, as an example, are destroyed. How do funds go back in um, to make sure that communities can get back on their feet? How does defunding and reinvesting in public works, education, healthcare actually happen and of course, all of the new, uh, you know, how substantive and systemic will the new legal and civil rights pushes be uh, to actually make a dent um, in this horrifying problem? Uh, we talked about Washington, D.C. Of course, uh, Mayor Bowser endorsed Mike Bloomberg. Uh, so this is obviously not someone uh, who would ever say if we knew anything uh, took police violence, police brutality uh, seriously in any way, shape, or form. But of course, she was quite able to jump on the brand of it. We're going to see some uh, similar things from Bill de Blasio. Uh, and I'm sure other cities, even as the real question becomes, what do you do about redirecting funds um, for the social good and for public good and actually dismantling and ending the systemic racism of these institutions. Um, so it's a very complicated time. Uh, Lester Spence, who's a great scholar uh, in Baltimore, you know, tweeted out today that basically now the next phase becomes uh, making sure that this does not get just simply redirected into, you know, essentially the HR and training industry. Not that those things don't have a role, but they're not a structural role. They're not a fundamental role. They're not going to address the questions that we fundamentally need to address about the economy, that we fundamentally need to address about basically consigning tens of millions of people uh, to being outside of the economy, having no social provision, uh, and facing the consequences of all of the systemic ills, racism, class structure, uh, and, and everything else, that the police are there to police. They're there to terrorize communities on the periphery um, to make way for everything else. That's the economic design of, uh, behind it. Now, this is of course gonna include, as I said, everything from serious and robust civil rights packages, legal changes, uh, cutting and redeploying funds, um, getting rid of every form of broken windows policing, replacing pol you know, uh, uh, police with social workers, all the things that we've been talking about. And some of this does include 
things that even someone like LBJ said needed to happen in the 1960s, that you could never have the substantive, you know, full achievements of the rights revolution if you did not get rid of um, embedded racism in institutions and also get rid of the brutal economic inequities that make any discourse on uh, equality a joke. So thankfully, this uh, is coming to the forefront right now. And you know who doesn't like that? Well, the same little guy who can't watch sports anymore, Ben Shapiro. This is where we really get to the crux of the systematic, systemic racism argument. You say, okay, so a lot of this is bad decision making and individual decision making that you could change. And they say, you're right, but that is a result of legacies of racism. You say, okay, so what do you really want? Right? What do you want? And the answer is always, well, what we want is basically systemic injustice. What we would like is to treat the institutions of the United States as though they are unjust, even though today they are not unjust. Right? So it's, it's, a logical, right. it's a logical argument where you, you pull sort of one hand over the other. You start with history has consequences. Then you go to all inequality is the result of history. And then you go from there to, and the corrective for that inequality is to do something unjust today. Because there are no institutions in the United States that are legally systemically racist. It does not exist. I mean, it's illegal in the United States. You can't do that. And there are no, and by the way, the only, the only aspects of American life that are legally racist are legally racist on behalf of minority groups, right? Affirmative action programs, for example. And so what is actually being requested? What is actually being requested is your acquiescence to the belief that if somebody does not succeed in American life, that is due to factors beyond their control and therefore in your control. And the only way that you can absolve yourself from having victimized this person you've never met and never done anything to is to acquiesce to the complete rewriting of America's systems that generated this stuff in the first place, even if they've already been rewritten. It's the movement from equal opportunity to equality of outcome. It's something that LBJ talked about openly in the 1960s. He said, we have to move beyond the idea of equal rights before law and equal justice before law. We have to move beyond that to equal outcome. That's the only way to measure decency. Now, that's an argument I'm not willing to buy because I don't think that you can measure decency by equal outcome. I think people make different decisions. I think history has consequences. And I think that very often the corrective to bad history is good decision-making today by the individual. And this is true for every community, black, white, green, Jewish, doesn't matter. Wow, green and Jewish. Uh, that's, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> so he's, um, you know, as he always does, in a complete mess, conflating endless amount of things here. But let's, let's just start with a very simple fact. In spite of laws on the books, and I'll quote now from a piece in Vox in 2018, right, 19 rather, Workplace discrimination is illegal, but our data still shows that it's a huge problem. And of course, it goes on to explain that there are thousands of cases of jobs discrimination reported each year. Wall Street banks uh, have in recent years all come together uh, to pay nominal fines because of uh, upholding discriminatory lending uh, policies, as an example. So regardless of what's on the books, these things still persist across the board in American society. Then we get to this nonsense about equality of outcomes and what LBJ was talking about. Nobody is talking about, and this is, this is used by these right-wing jokers all the time. No one is saying everybody gets to chair the physics department at MIT. Everybody gets to be a Grand Slam tennis champion. Everybody gets to be a movie star. No, it's really basic. Everybody gets health care. Everybody gets housing. Everybody gets food. Everybody gets a base economic security and decency without which the promises of a liberal democracy are a fraud. And this is also in the most current wave of, you know, liberal philosophy too, maybe outside of sort of pop intellectualism. But if you read, you know, a Rawls for an example, they'll say like what a liberal society pro promises in terms of substantive rights essentially is, again, it just isn't real if there's not a significant economics rights dimension. Then you add to that the legacies of racialized capitalism in this country 
And that's when you get the incredible statistics. Like if you do single payer universal health care, if you radically increase taxes at the top rate and redistribute to public works projects, to education, to all of these other areas, not only of course would that be enormously better for basically all Americans who aren't rich, that would signify the largest, some of the largest racial redistributions of wealth in American history because again, American capitalism has been racialized from its inception. Yeah. Now, Where I don't the- know what else, what else was he saying? Uh, yes, and by the way, making individual decisions uh, is good and great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, the, uh, it's just a complete non sequitur. The logic philosopher kind of gives the game away when he, he says in this tone, all inequality is the result of history. Well, we know that actually most of wealth comes from in- things like inheritance and proximity to capital, capital generally. So let's say, for instance, if a certain class or type of person was kept out of the major wealth building investment, let's say, for instance, housing. And let's say something like inheritance exists. Like, yes, you're going to see history continue to live on through financial structures. Yeah, I mean, that, right. That, that is, to, uh, to snag from Hillary Clinton, that is living history. And there's a reason why you can show, you know, stats that essentially, like, look, if you're born, there, there's pretty much nothing that tells you more about the outcome of somebody's life than the income or wealth of their parents. That is the number one metric. You know, you can get into it. So it is, it is actually very funny when he does make that, like, it's the result of history. So we don't do anything about it. And it's like, right, it is the result of history continuing to be enacted and brutalize and discriminate against and impoverish people across all of these metrics. Maybe that's why we have such an incredibly dysfunctional society. But Ben is not there to talk about those things. And he's got bigger worries to get to, like Sports Illustrated had Bruce Jenner on the cover so he can't pretend to like baseball anymore, whatever. Or pretend to like basketball anymore, NFL. I'm, I'm no, no hate on baseball. I love baseball, but I might be prepared to believe that Ben Shapiro genuinely likes baseball. <laughs> yeah. Ben Shapiro is a uh, Celtics fan from LA, so that tells you everything you need to know about. Are you ser- contrary- Are you yeah, legitimately yeah. serious? He's yeah. actually he's a wait. He grew up in Los Angeles, California. In the '90s, yeah. That is one of the that is that is a rivalry that was built in the eighty it, even actually wait earlier than the eighties. Then you had a, a period. What was the Doc Rivers era with those? When what was that? Uh, like late late two thousands, yeah. yeah, like late two thousands. That is one of the that that is one of the deepest rivalries in sports, and he just happened to just be like, you know what I like? The White Celtics, see. <laughs> you know, the reason I like the Celtics, it's, it's probably the most offensive mascot that's never going to be changed. So I'm going to pick a winner. Jesus. Wow. <laughs> I would really love, well, not really, but a part of me would be amused to know what the BS gymnastics are for him explaining why he, as an L.A. person, loves the Celtics. I would love to hear that. I would love... I would love for him. I would love to hear the accidental explanation that gets into like, they're less flashy. <laughs> Celtics don't hog the ball. Um, let's see. Man, if the Celtics <laughs> a mask. <laughs> He's got a How the hell does someone from LA become a Celtics fan? Spoiler, spoiler alert! Somebody beat them in 2019. If they play like this, though, <laughs> if they dribble the ball around like that. All right. Hey, we have Alexander on, by the way. All right. Yes. Yeah, sorry. We should. I, I. I should not get distracted uh, by figuring out the roots of Ben Shapiro's uh, Celtic fandom because we have a very good guest uh, to get to. Um, and I guess yeah, we're gonna. Uh, take her right on. We won't take a break. Um, Alexandria Neeson is a writer, 
uh, whose work has appeared in multiple outlets, including The Village Voice. And uh, we're talking actually about a piece that she wrote in 2019. The story has gotten, or excuse me, uh, officials say in Chicago and elsewhere, police departments plant misinformation to the press. And it was published in the Columbia Journalism Review. Alexandria, are you there? I'm here. Um, we can't, uh, and it, it's no problem if you don't want to. Oh, great. Okay, your video's on. <laughs> you totally anticipated that. Um, so you wrote this piece in 2019, basically about how uh, police are, I mean, essentially favored by the, you know, the, the press in terms of their accounts of killings, of brutality, um, that they are able to set the narrative. And I want to get to this, and you have some uh, very specific stories that we need to get to that you reported on, obviously. But I, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen police shoot rubber bullets at reporters, including, you know, <laughs> Uh, I, watching this reporter from uh, German cable news, just sort of trying to set a shot in Minneapolis. He's getting shot. We've seen reporters from really a very wide array of uh, news outlets being attacked. And obviously, this is there's nothing, uh, you know, reporters' lives and well-being are not more important than anybody else. But it does actually show significant along with everything else they've been doing the last couple of weeks, the specific action of, of attacking reporters is very brazen and not something that they're, you know, trying to hide in any way, shape or form. So I'm just wondering with your history of reporting on this, what do you make of that level of aggressiveness that you've seen from them specifically towards the press? And do you, you know, obviously it's going to change some attitudes, but how far reaching do you think, uh, those experiences for the for the press could be in, in having police attack them while they're doing their jobs? Um, I mean, I think the last couple of years we've seen, um, we've seen the press sort of have to weather uh, verbal attacks from the highest rungs of government. Um, and I think that's been a wide range, uh, a conversation that has been happening in the press um, and in our newspapers and our airwaves for the last couple of years. Um, and so there's certainly a heightened attention uh, being paid to that in terms of freedoms of the press and what our constitutional rights are. Um, with this escalating to physical violence, um, certainly this is not the first time. Um, I think that there are reporters working particular beats here and abroad who have always been subject to violence, to physical violence. Um, seeing it happen domestically and in such a widespread way I think has been jarring for some folks, um, readers and the public and reporters alike. Um, in terms of changing attitudes, um, I think you made the point that the safety of a journalist is not more important than the safety um, of anybody walking down the street. Um, but I think that the, I think what, what we're likely to see or what we are seeing is that um, folks are sort of using physical attacks on the press as a means by which they can get folk, people who previously didn't care about similar attacks on general members of the public, particularly people from certain marginalized communities, um, to sort of get them to care, to wake them up. It's the sort of, um, it's the argument that if it's happening, you know, to reporters while they're live on CNN, then think about what might be happening to people when there are no cameras around or to people who don't enjoy the prominence of being a national reporter. Um, and so I think that there's a sort of awareness spreading that it's not just about what it means when the, when the police are physically violent with the press when they're outside trying to do their jobs, but also what that suggests about the larger institution of policing and the violence that people in communities all over the country experience every day. And this uh, piece goes into really, a I mean, a very extended history of this relationship between and basically the press almost being like a PR department for the police, um, which I want us to get into, but can you start by telling us the story, and this is how you begin your piece of Joshua Beale? Sure, um, so Joshua Beale, um, 
is a man from Indianapolis who in the fall of 2016 was in Chicago for a relative's funeral. Um, and there was a procession, a car procession leaving a cemetery in a neighborhood called Mount Greenwood in Chicago. Um, and Mount Greenwood is a neighborhood that is uh, predominantly white in a city um, in which the majority of the population are people of color. Um, and it's in particular notable because it's home to many of the city's cops and firefighters. Um, and there's a cemetery there. They were leaving the uh, cemetery after having buried a relative and there was this sort of altercation on the street. Um, and basically um, a car cut off some of the vehicles that were in the funeral pr pr uh, procession um, and an argument began, people got out of their cars. Um, and what happened was that uh, two narratives quickly emerged. Um, Joshua Beal got out of his car um, and there were two men who later we found out were police officers, off-duty police officers. Um, and there was, there was sort of a lot of chaos. There was loud music, there was a lot of yelling and this argument very quickly escalated. Um, and there were dozens of 911 calls made from the scene uh, in which bystanders were describing two white men waving guns around. Um, and uh, Joshua Beal, who was legally licensed to carry a firearm, um, retrieved his uh, a firearm from his car. Um, and, you know, minutes later, he was dead in the street. Um, and very quickly, two separate narratives emerged from this scene. There was the police narrative, um, and then there was what uh, his family said and what bystanders said. The police said that what had happened were two officers, Joseph Treacy and Thomas Darwin, um, were off duty and sort of happened upon this. Uh, happened upon this. Um, Joseph Treacy got into an argument. Um, there was, you know, the the police said that um, someone had been blocking a fire lane and that that's how the argument had began. Um, and uh, notably, uh, the police said that Joseph, uh, excuse me, Joshua Beal had fired his weapon first and that uh, they had returned fire. Um, and they also said that both uh, Darwin and Tracy were in uniform and obviously law enforcement. This was not reflected in any of the 911 calls that came from bystanders and the family um, who was there insisted that it was not clear at all that they were law enforcement. Um, and so what you had is the police saying that they were justified in shooting and killing him um, because it was obvious that they were police and that he made the decision not to lower his weapon and everyone else saying that these were just two angry white guys in the street waving guns and that Joshua Beale pull, uh, brought his firearm out in self-defense um, in response to them having pulled a gun first. Um, and what happened is that you know, reporters get to the scene and they start to write these stories and they start to speak to the communications representatives um, who represent the Chicago Police Department. Um, and those details about um, the officers being in uniform, about um, Beale having pulled his weapon first, they start to leak into the stories that are written and that appear in local news media. Um, and in you know, the detail about the cops having been in uniform in particular really spread. Um, and it sort of started with Anthony Guglielmi, who's the chief communications officer for the Chicago Police Department, telling that to reporters. Uh, the police chief also repeated this to reporters. It appears on the nightly news and, and in local newspapers. It was also in the autopsy report. Um, and you know, you've got, and then months later, 911 calls are released and the family sort of from the first, from day one had always insisted that no, they weren't in uniform and nobody had any idea who, they, uh, who these people were. Um, and so you started to see this spread and spread and spread um, and it wasn't challenged uh, you know, by reporters until months and months and months later. Um, this came you know, just two years after the city of Chicago had erupted in protests over the murder of Laquan McDonald. And so it was a familiar scene where, um, you know, a black man is killed by police and the police say one thing happened and everyone else says that something else happened. Um, Maya Dukmasova, who is a local reporter um, for the Chicago Reader, she wrote a piece 18 months later um, examining the misinformation, uh, particularly that the, the officers were in uniform and sort of detailed um, 
you know, why that hadn't been challenged by reporters, even as through the course of the investigation of this, of this incident, um, sort of began to reveal more and more uh, that this was just a blatant lie. And then the La Laquan McDonald case, they put out a, a complete misrepresentation of his murder. And the only reason, I mean, that was, that was cleared because videotape, which they had suppressed, actually got released to the public. Right. Um, and so that, you know, with Laquan McDonald, the, the story was that um, the officer was justified in shooting and killing him because he had been holding a knife and had lunged at reporters. Um, and then, you know, report, uh, reporters filed, you know, over a dozen freedom of information uh, requests to um, release the tape that would show what actually happened and the all of them were denied the police department's line was that releasing it would in, interfere with their ability to conduct a proper investigation um and so an investigative report the only reason it was released was because an investigative reporter sued the the, the city and the department um, and a judge sided with the reporter and so the tape was released and what we all know now is that you know what the police said happened just didn't just never happened um, and in fact, um, that officer, Jason Van Dyke, um, was later arrested and convicted. Um, and it was also found that there were other officers who misrepresented and deliberately fabricated information about what happened in that moment with Laquan McDonald. So there was a history already um, that even extends beyond Laquan McDonald of the Chicago Police Department and many other police departments of things like this happening. Yeah, you go in incredible, I mean, this, this, one of the great things about this piece is it really is a history. And I'm going to quote, and specifically, I'll quote from you, and you can start, uh, maybe tell us also about the divergence of, uh, of, of basically the origins and essentially black media of attempting to actually tell, um, you know, at least a fully filled out narrative for all of these kinds of stories going back to the, the 1830s. Um, if I'm, yeah, I think the 1830s. Um, and you, you basically say, um, and I'm sorry, I actually missed, I lost my place here. Uh, but basically that in modern American police departments emerged in the 1830s out of a desire to control quote unquote disorder in growing cities, starting with Boston, uh, New York City followed, then Albany, then Chicago. Uh, police officers were offered steady full-time employment, supported by public funds, had a broad mandate to define what, quote-unquote, this order meant. And they were valorized by American culture, including in the mainstream press. Crime stories provided great heroes' tales and horror dramas to sell newspapers. In the eyes of people from marginalized communities, the press was an ally of police who were enforcers of white supremacy and then you take us into the story of Emmett Till. Can you just in any way you want really fill out that history for us and you know specifically with that angle of how different parts of the press are covering this and, and presenting this? Sure so the earliest uh, examples of what we now call police departments um, you know, their primary characteristics, according to historians, were in fact corruption and brutality. Um, so it's interesting to consider how we frame conversations about modern police brutality now. Um, at, you know, you hear uh, police unions um, and, and other folks um, sort of talk about police brutality like it's an exception to the rule, the whole, the, the whole concept of a bad apple amongst mostly good ones, um, which is just plainly a historical. Um, Gary Potter, who's a historian at Eastern Kentucky University, um, says that from day one, um, the police departments were notoriously corrupt and notoriously uh, brutal in their handlings with the public. Um, and like everything in this country, white supremacy is sort of the underlying current that drove American policing. Um, and so, you know, particularly as Black people um, began to, you know, earn or, or fight for more extended rights in this country, um, you started to see a lot of different institutions mobilize um, in overt and covert ways to suppress that. And one of the ways that they have done that in terms of curtailing the freedoms that Black people 
um, were pushing for is through policing. Um, you know, uh, one of the biggest ways that they were helped by that was through mainstream press that was uh, run by largely by white people. Um, and so you saw uh, in reporting on the black community, a lot of stereotypes, outright racism, um, you know, people who uh, should not have been given um, space in, in newspapers were given space. Um, and and the, Emmett, the case of Emmett Till is a, a really is a really good example of that. So when Emmett Till was murdered, you saw white newspapers in the South. Um, their reporting on this um, sort of offered a benefit of the doubt to the police and to the men who were accused. Um, that was inappropriate. Uh, you know, they were running stories that were quoting sheriffs that were making wild accusations, like the entire thing was fabricated by the NAACP. Um, they were calling, you know, they were focusing intensely on the alleged infraction as though that was justification for his brutal, brutal murder. Um, you know, you saw headlines that said things like wolf whistle boy. Um, and, and, and so all of this, you know, helped the public sort of excuse what had happened. Um, and so the black press, the black press, press ha has always played a role in sort of countering those narratives. Um, and I think that, you know, there was, there's, there's some criticism that uh, the mainstream would lodge at the black press and say that, well, these are advocates, these are not real reporters, it's not real journalism, when in fact, they were just telling the whole truth, the actual truth. Um, because we couldn't rely on mainstream newspapers to do so. Um, and if you move through history, you know, you see examples of this happening all the time uh, up until, you know, the t modern times where we've got this sort of cushy relationship between journalists and police departments who previously relied on them uh, for sources of, for, as sources of information. Um, one of the big problems is that, um, journalists had to maintain, um, they had to be sort of in good favor with police officers so that they could rely on them to feed them information so that they could write stories. And so what you saw is that it was rare that you would see stories about police corruption, um, anything that would make police departments look bad. That did start to shift. Uh, for my, When I was reporting on this story, I talked with um, a veteran New York reporter uh, named Jim Mulvaney. Um, and he talked about how, you know, early in his career, when he was covering cops uh, in New York City, you know, he would show up to the precinct with um, a box of donuts and, you know, put the donuts out and say, okay, guys, like, tell me what's going on. And he was talking to street cops. Um, and, po you know, Watergate happened and he attributes this to, he attributes the shift as happening post Watergate where there was a renewed interest in investigative journalism focused specifically on institutional corruption. Um, and then you start to see police departments close ranks. And so it was much, much harder for reporters to be talking with um, the police officers who were actually on the street in neighborhoods. Um, and you started to see them refer uh, journalists to public information officers. And so you have sort of the birth of the modern uh, communications teams that are now present at every police department. Um, and those teams function ostensibly as, uh, you know, an arm of transparency, uh, the middleman between the department and the public when um, in practice, they're public relations teams. Um, and so, you know, their function is in, uh, you know, Jim Mulvaney's words is to make the cops look good. Um, and so you sort of have, you know, and so it was like, we've always had an issue with the way that the press and, you know, the lar larger American culture valorizes cops as heroes and good guys and out fighting the good fight. Um, and, and, you know, that compounds into the problem of a communications department that exercises broad control over information about uh, how the police interact with the public. Um, and, you know, so now journalists are, are having to deal with an inability to actually get the information that we need to, to do the reporting that has to be done. Yeah, and so that starts to parallel the, this whole problem across journalism that you talk about, it's just like slashing budgets, not enough funds to do investigative reporting of any kind. And it reminded me, actually, 
in a really different context, but a friend of mine was uh, working to expand uh, Medicaid in a very red state. And, you know, he was saying like, you still actually do have small newspapers that exist in little towns in a way that probably, you know, people who live in major cities don't think of in the same way anymore. And you're talking about like maybe one person works at this newspaper, maybe two. And, you know, a Koch Brothers Network has an organizer for that part of the state who can give them a free op-ed, who can give them, you know, their version of stats really easily. So that was another thing that I got in the modern iteration from your piece that it, it kind of tracks everything, that there was this wave of we need to interrogate policing like everything else, uh, you know, the Nixon administration, potentially corporate power, uh, whatever. And now uh, there's just this like broad base of decline while police have major PR infrastructure in place. Yeah, the other thing um, that is really uh, troubling that is happening at the same time as newsrooms are losing reporters and losing funding and in some cases, totally shuttering outlets altogether. Um, police departments, uh, their communications teams have become increasingly sophisticated and in fact, sometimes are hiring their own uh, reporters um, to work on behalf of the police department. Um, and you know, so now they're sort of, where before they uh, were sort of controlling information released to the press. They're now in some cases saying, well, we don't have to release information to the press at all because we can devise our own, you know, quote, newsroom um, and control the flow of information in that way, uh, which is <laughs> troubling. I mean, do you think there's, I mean, there's so many elements of this, but people, I mean, are talking about all sorts of various questions of regulation, defunding, reinvesting different legal decisions civil rights packages do you think there's like a specific room for particularly with public money like regulating pr departments or trying to introduce transparency in that area um i mean i think that it certainly should be a public priority uh to be looking at ways that we can bolster, uh, you know, existing and new newsrooms who are dedicated to this beat. Um, I'm not sure what it would look like to regulate, you know, a communications team that operates inside of a police department. Um, but if the, you know, but if the, if we consider the ways in which our laws protect police departments generally. Um, I, it's a little, it's difficult to envision um, a legislative fix for that. Um, you know, this, a lot of the information that reporters uh, need and, and try to get access to to do their jobs now has been shielded in New York, for example. Um, and, you know, this was just repealed the other day, but there's a 40 year old law that um, kept disciplinary records of police officers from public scrutiny. And so that has been, you know, a major roadblock for reporters, um, especially in writing stories about police brutality. Um, and so there, we are in this sort of moment of shift where politicians and certainly the public are, are really pushing back against things like that uh, and saying, you know, we need increased transparency and you can't keep this stuff from the public. Um, so maybe there's room in there for something. Um, I'm not sure what it might look like to specifically, uh, in a legislative way, um, hold the communications teams, I guess, accountable for the ways in which they handle this information. Yeah. I'm just, I'm wondering if, if, uh, if they're hiring outside firms as an example, I mean, it's just like, there's a lot of, you know, you see this in so many areas of essentially like public funds getting used to allocate to do propaganda for, you know, areas of the government that are abusing the public. I, don't, I agree with you, though. It's probably very difficult to regulate, but something we need to know about. Um, and this piece goes into. So 
now is like the general, you know, wrap up question. Like you wrote this piece in 2019. We've had this incredible wave of uprisings that are going to manifest in, you know, so many different ways. Uh, what, like what, in any direction do you want to go? Like, what do you see happening now? What's your feeling now as pertains, you know, particularly I think to this article and kind of, uh, pushing back against essentially, you know, PR from police departments, uh, whatever else you think is important to touch on. I think um, one of the big takeaways for journalists in particular, um, I think is that even for journalists who have been trying to do good work on this beat, I think there's a sort of reckoning um, where we're all considering the ways in which we have uh, contributed to this problem, um, and not just the problem of, you know, misinformation being spread via our stories, um, but really looking at how we do our jobs. Um, so when something happens and we show up, who are the first people that we that we talk to? Often it's the police, even even reporters who who understand that there's sort of like a, you know, that have it's been demonstrated by their own experience that the police often lie. Um, and I think that there's this sort of examination of American culture that um, that journalism, that American journalism, is not exempt to, uh, where we give them the benefit, give police departments the benefit of the doubt, where there's a there's a sort of regard for uh, authority um, that seeps into how we do our how we conduct our reporting. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether it's intentional or not. The reality is that it happens. And I think that what we're seeing is uh, people really starting to sort of take stock of that in a, in a significant way at the demands of the public. Um, and so it's not just that, you know, we've spent days and days and days watching the cops beat people up on the street. Um, it's also, you know, readers saying, look at how you cover this. Let's consider the language that we use. There's been a lot of really good criticism um, that looks at, you know, how we describe the protests of the last two weeks. Um, you know, what do we really mean when we're using words like chaos or rage or uh, riot or looters? Um, and how does that contribute? Um, how does that contribute to this larger problem of even with the evidence right in our faces? continuing to uh, sort of make space for the for the possibility that the behavior of the police is justified. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, people are starting to really take a look um, at the ways that we contribute to this every day. It's a really, really good piece. Um, officials say, um, and of course, you can also read uh, more of Alexandria's work in the Columbia Journalism Review. But Alexandria Neeson, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. Great, thanks. All right, folks, um, we are probably not gonna take a break. I'm still getting used to the flow um, uh, for whatever reason, even though I really should be used to this by now uh, <laughs> because we've been in, we've been quarantined. We've been doing quarantine broadcasting now for three months. Yep, month three of 96. Month three of 96, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't anticipate, I mean, I just can't even imagine, like, and maybe this is wrong too, but I'm thinking, like, studio, live shows, all of that, not earlier than summer 2021. I I, I just can't picture yeah. it. I mean, there's, there's nothing I see to indicate otherwise. Like, I'm still getting used to the idea of, of like, you know, just even like, I don't know, going out to like, you know, doing more uh, grocery shopping or whatever, I mean, or, or like not trying to time it. <laughs> so it's at, you know, the uh, the lowest uh, flow times. Uh, folks become, and I really, that, uh, that piece was really good because again, everybody knows that I really, really like the historical angles on things and those waves of uh, reporting on police and then uh, the black media emerging to actually mm -hmm. properly cover these stories and the parallel history there. Yeah. And then 
you know, getting the 70s and the sort of broader interest in investigative journalism, then cresting back with the overall just complete decline of journalism across the board. It's a, it's a really well written, fleshed out it, piece. It's very interesting that she goes all the way back to the 1830s because, yeah, the origin story of journalism wasn't let's help all the black people. Like it was, and Walt Whitman himself was, started definitely not <laughs> writing writing hack racist crime uh, stories uh, in Brooklyn, and they would dwell on like the physiognomy of the the um, the villains, basically just like just the most horrible. Like that's the origin story of that's when the press was getting really popular. It was peddling this sort of stuff. So pretty Absolutely. horrifying. I mean, that's, yeah, like that sort of like, yeah, right. The history of the press is is more Breitbart than not. Um, Abolish both. the press. Censorship now. <laughs> become a member of the Majority Report today, majority.fm slash become a member. That is how this show happens. And that's how, in fact, we remain uncensored. Go to the Michael Brooks show. Become a patron, patreon.com slash TMBS, where you will get unparalleled amounts of content, detailed histories. We're going to release our two-part history of Samara Mashal in the coming weeks, the revolutionary leader of Mozambique. Uh, and we have a two-part series coming up on Pakistan, the ISI, the CIA, and Imran Khan. And on Friday, I think we're going to... Um, premiere an interview we just did with Cedric Johnson, who's an, uh, one of the most interesting scholars of, uh, of actually of, of post-Katrina New Orleans. We're talking about what's happening um, and uh, in terms of the uprisings, the connections to the beyond the public good, beyond the technical fix, the policing and how it fits with a whole larger conversation about the economy, geography, and everything else relevant. Patreon.com slash TMBS, Michael Brooks Show on YouTube. And of course, next Tuesday, Noam Chomsky will explain to us his pioneering work on why only people who have known each other since puberty can police each other, following up on Greg's insightful contributions from yesterday. Uh, Matt. Yeah, uh, twitch.tv slash literary hangover. Go subscribe there. Um, I am going to be doing... Uh, James Fulmer Cooper's The Pilot, which is sort of the original American sea tale uh, while playing Assassin's Creed Rogue, which is set in this, kind of the same time period. So 1700s. Sweet. Jamie. Hello. So this week on the Antifada, we had our 100th episode. Congrats. Really? Thank you. Um, we don't number the bonuses and uh, like various and sundry side projects. So it's probably closer to 200, but I really like that we hit up 100 at this particular point in our history because, you know, it feels like something is happening. So uh, the Antifada crew and I, me, Sean and Andy, we uh, did a little analysis of the uprisings happening all over the place. We talked about our own experiences going out to the protests and um shall, i'll call them protest plus that have been happening in new york city um we did a little bit of the history the political economy of um how race and racism have been used to uh keep class struggle down keep everybody down uh and i think it was uh, pretty good so that's out now also, we did a little Q&A. We answered some listeners' questions, and that's going to be out on Friday as a free bonus. And also today uh, at 3 p.m., we are doing a Line Goes Down on Twitch, twitch.tv slash the Antifada. I'm going to join Sean and the Line Goes Down crew, and we are going to talk about a piece that uh, our Line Goes Down buddies wrote about the political economy of the COVID crisis. So that's going to be at 3 p.m. today, right after this show. So check it out, twitch.tv slash the Antifada. Check out the Nomiki show. Uh, folks, we'll see you in the fun half. Left is best. 
Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. Uh, 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 ooh. Wow. Uh, uh, um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No ooh. worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Welcome to the fun half. Uh, we are here. Um, just going to start with uh, the latest jobs report. Jobless claims, uh, there's about another 1.54 million Americans who filed for unemployment benefits. Uh, quote a little bit from Yahoo Finance. On the heels of the blowout May jobs report, market participants got another update on how the U.S. labor market is fearing amid the ongoing uh, COVID-19 crisis with the weekly jobs claim report on Thursday, an additional 1.542 uh, uh, million, a million Americans filed for unemployment benefits in the week, in the week ending June 6, below economists' expectations of 155 million jobless claims. Weekly initial job claims have decelerated for 10 consecutive weeks. The prior week's figures were revised uh, uh, to a higher 1.879 million from the previously reported 1.88 million over the past three months. More than 44 million Americans have filed for unemployment insurance. So we're seeing the reopenings happening. Uh, we're seeing obviously Corona accelerating and spiking again. Uh, and, and moving up again in different parts of the country, like Texas, which, you know, crazily prematurely opened. Uh, Heroes Act uh, is going to, you know, get taken up. The already piddling bill that the House Democrats have put forward does do some good, good things, but not nearly enough in terms of things having to do with rent and housing security and, uh, you know, the paycheck protection, which... Premila Jaipal put forward that might be the most important aspect of it that Pelosi took out. And then, of course, 
uh, you know, Mitch McConnell and the Republicans uh, and, you know, will have their way with it. So I don't think, I mean, I, it, it's weird because Josh Barrow in New York Magazine actually is sort of coming forward uh, as an example. And other people are sort of almost, you know, kind of saying, hey, look, it seems like the worst of it is over uh, because the declines are slowing. But the truth of the matter is, is that, I mean, 44 million Americans unemployed uh, and, you know, the head of the Fed came out and, you know, is predicting nowhere near a return to anything like we had pre-COVID until I think, you know, 2022. So they'll keep interest rates down uh, and, you know, we'll see. But certainly on a political level, I don't think this slowdown is going to help Trump and also uh whatever small, tiny gains were finally try starting to show up before COVID in terms of actual earnings going up, uh, this is washed away. And then the next wave is, you know, God knows what Amazon as an example is doing uh, to our brick and mortar economy uh, as, you know, a lot of these retail places as an example, just aren't coming back. So this is, this is bad, folks. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up Amazon, actually, because unemployment alone is not necessarily a very good index of how regular Americans are doing economically, right? And if unemployment does start to go down, it's probably going to be because people with no other choice were forced into crappy jobs like Amazon. Amazon has been doing a major hiring spree right now as if to... Uh, consolidate their control further over the, you know, the selling things business, but also to show the workers who are trying to organize that they are expendable, that there's an infinite supply of scab labor coming in. So just because un if unemployment might start to go down, you're probably going to see it. But what is actually happening is people who have no other options because no help is coming from the Democrats or the Republicans um, getting jobs in uh, essential work, essential labor that is underpaid and they have to work multiple gigs to survive. Absolutely. And now we have uh, just a little bit of, I want to just uh, note this as well from new uh, piece, uh, David Day and the American Prospect, because now we're going into the CARES Act was signed into law 76 days ago. Um, so, you know, we, we talking about the macro indicators, you know, the basic emergency uh, provisions to people, $1,200 checks are starting to run out. Obviously, the uh, beefed up unemployment insur insurance, which was, you know, obviously a good thing that Bernie Sanders got in, uh, was already under attack by, as an example, you know, Southern Republican governors and uh, Mike DeWine in Ohio that didn't want uh to pay unemployment insurance. So there was that, uh, you know, uh, dangerous rush to reopen when, of course, we see the consequences of that in terms of spike cases in places like uh, Texas. Um, but let's also look back at, you know, the oversight provision of it, because, of course, the vast majority of the CARES Act was just essentially trillions of dollars of completely unaccountable money uh, getting washed into the most powerful corporations and in wealthy individuals on earth. And, you know, we've gone through this, this just despicable story so many times of, you know, like Nancy Pelosi Democrats, uh, you know, slow walking things, not fighting for, as an example, you know, automatic uh, stabilizers like food stamp expansion which absolutely should have been in all of these bills, which of course the Trump administration is still trying to cut. And, you know, uh, you know, slicing and nibbling around all of these, uh, you know, direct benefits to people because, you know, God forbid somebody that makes 70 grand a year uh, gets a little bit more help in this economic context when the vast majority of what has actually been pumped into the economy, of course, are going to, you know, are literally directly benefiting the most wealthy people on earth and not translating uh, to companies, you know, refraining from laying people off or anything like that. And, you know, again, we essentially have 
basically amounts to about four trillion dollar slush fund that Steve Mnuchin has discretion over. And I'll just quote now, um, much of the oversight, this is from David Dane, particularly of the bailout aspects of the CARE Act is probably going to come from the Congressional Oversight Commission, which specifically was charged with monitoring the Federal Reserve's 4.5 trillion money cannon. There are supposed to be five members on the commission, one chosen by each leader in the House and Senate, and a fifth, the chair, uh, chosen by mutual agreement between Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell. Again, it's been 76 days, and there's still no chair of the Congressional Oversight Commission. Um, and this is an hour ago from Public Citizen. Steve Mnuchin is now outright refusing to disclose businesses receiving, uh, what is this, 4.5 million uh how much? I don't even know. What is that? What's that number, Brendan? Five hundred trillion. Five. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Five hundred billion. Excuse me. Five hundred billion. Re- okay. Yeah. He's refusing to disclose businesses that are receiving five hundred billion in bailout funds, claiming the info is confidential. Four point five million businesses receive government funds. Zero transparency. Uh, and again, it's just a. I mean, this is pure corruption. And if you want to get, you know, theorize about it, and, and I, I don't, like, this should be a really term that everybody needs to learn. I mean, we are in the era of just unmitigated platform monopoly capitalism. And part of it that's so disturbing is because basically the Fed is one of the only aspects left of the federal government that even works, that is designed to just funnel money into Wall Street, to funnel money into the big monopoly firms in this country, that even the Small Business Administration uh, was not equipped to getting emergency bailout funds to smaller parts of the economy. This is from Politico. Mnuchin says it's proprietary and confidential information. <laughs> the, small, the, small, uh, the Small Business Administration is also withholding PPP loan data the agency requested as part of its oversight efforts. Yeah, that means we are going to do this undemocratically and unaccountably. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And and not I mean and that would happen and you know this is always so important to monitor not that it wouldn't have been anyways. Of course, right? I mean we saw this of course we all know we go back to the bailouts of the recession in 2008 were they democratically accountable? No. Did they bail out Wall Street in a completely unaccountable way after Wall Street melted the economy and destroyed trillions of wealth? Yes, absolutely. But they still actually felt more of a necessity to go through some motions. Mm -hmm. There's no motions here. Well, I'm not an accelerationist, but we are certainly in the accelerationist timeline, right? And one thing that may come of this is small businesses, a lot of them aren't going to make it. And there will be a further consolidation of control over the economy by giants like Amazon. And it's possible. I mean, nothing's a given. We have to organize. But when everybody works for the same one or two evil corporations, it might be easier in some ways to uh, to do class struggle, to gin up hate against the bosses than when your boss is like someone you kind of know and kind of like, you know, just trying to see the silver linings here. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the bad news is they have billions and billions of dollars to try to counteract whatever positive. Trillions. That I mean, trillions. I mean, you could look at, I mean, honestly, you could look at these bailouts as essentially a, uh, in some ways they function War fund. as a, yeah, they're just an unlimited strike break fund. I mean, yeah. if, if that was to even happen, but also look, I mean, I, I think it's a balance because I, I, I definitely have heard this argument that Jamie's making and there's some like, Like I, yeah, there is some element of like, you really, you get to a level of monopoly where you completely clarify the relationship between capital and labor. Um, So, okay. And obviously, and look, and you do see there's some incredible organizing coming out of Amazon. On the other hand, um, especially for where we are right now, in terms of our political economy and people's basic well-being, it's a disaster that oh, yeah. what few small areas of 
non-monopolized monopolized capital are getting wiped out, wiped out because you know a lot of like actual small businesses you know function much more in the commons economy and actually have something to do with like the real economy of their context and that you know is just true and it's something that uh particularly in this political environment we really need to protect so. Yeah, I mean, my good friend's store is probably not going to make it through this. And part of the reason is there are grants for traditional businesses. There are no grants for co-ops. There are no grants for worker-owned co-ops. There are only loans that she's not going to be able to pay back later. So uh, I guess I, I feel like I bring her up a lot. Ainsley Earhart's got the chicken salad chick friend. I've got the friend who owns an intersectional feminist witch store. But unfortunately, that's Do not who's getting... Salad? <laughs> not not the last time I checked. Maybe they some like chicken salad. some kind of enchanted chicken. But, enchanted uh, vegan chicken. Maybe maybe that actually could be a good name for a reopen. <laughs> enchanted I'll, vegan salad. I'll I'll let her know if she even uh, stays in this town after no, that. But, I mean, but that's a serious. No, I mean that's it's a, really it's sad. It's it's, it's, it's horrible. Up. It's horrible, and it's affecting you know. And again, there there is something. Gar Alpovitz wrote a really good book a couple of years ago tracking um, basically the commons economy that does exist in this country in different fragments and exists globally. And it's not to like valorize these things. They have their problems like anything else, like anything would have. But the truth of the matter is, is that small businesses, worker co-ops, um, and other enterprises like this are some of the only areas left of some like actual power and democratic openings in the economy. And, you know, at the end of the day, like we're going to need all of the above. I mean, I, nothing happens in my view strategically without an incredibly powerful labor movement, how that happens. We don't know, but that is essential. There also is going to need to be, um, these alternatives, uh, real alternatives in the economy, like Cooperation Jackson, Madragon, and things like that. And this is hurting that, like, tremendously. So it's that's something we need to be very, very attentive to um, and fight back against at, to the extent you know, that we can. Uh, Donald Trump um, took to Twitter the other day and basically try now, you know, basically suggested that this 75 year old man, and I'm sure you have most likely seen this clip. It's just despicable. One of the most evil things imaginable, this line of riot cops, this uh, frail old man who goes up to them. He's talking, uh, you know, he almost comically doesn't pose a threat to, you know, anyone or anything, let alone fully regaled riot cops. Shove him to the ground. He cracks his head. They walk past and leave him bleeding. In fact, one cop who actually sort of pauses to say, like, maybe we should check him out is pushed forward by another cop. Like, we don't have time to attend to this old man that we just brutally injured. It really just incredibly evil, disgusting, disturbing stuff. And, you know, what Donald Trump does uh, in situations like this and, you know, what the right wing uh, does generally is, of course, reach for some ludicrous conspiracy theory nonsense. So he went on Twitter and tried to say that this guy was a provocateur and he was violent and, you know, Antifa and all the usual bullshit and nonsense. Of course, um, I mean, you know, there's always the two-step, which is uh, it really would not matter anything else that this old man had done, period, full stop. What we literally just saw was riot police shove an old man to the ground and crack his head. And, of course, it's all not true. And this is a veteran Catholic social justice peace activist who's been, you know, fighting the good fight to create a better life for all for decades. This is who these, you know, fucking thugs threw to the ground and cracked his head. 
So Donald Trump tweeted that it generated some backlash and Kaylee McEnany is uh, talking with Brian Kilmeade about it. So yesterday the president, uh, Kaylee, uh, was a, uh, tweeted out that this Buffalo protest of the 75 year old who was shoved to the ground by a police officer might have been part of Antifa and a provocateur in order to get that type of reaction, just to paraphrase. Could you expand on that? Does the president think that this, this guy is part of Antifa? So the president was raising questions based on a report that he saw. Uh, there are questions that need to be asked. In every case, we can't jump on one side uh, without looking at all the facts at play. This individual had some very questionable tweets, some profanity-laden tweets um, about police officers. Of course, no one condones any sort of violence. We need the appropriate amount of force used in any interaction. But there are a lot of questions in that case. In fact, you had 56 police officers who resigned in protest of how their fellow officers were treated. Um, so I think we need to ask why those officers resigned, what happened, what facts were on the ground. Um, and the president was just raising some of those questions. And Kaylee, what about the timing of it in the middle of the George Floyd ceremonies and the last of which a series of, of, uh, of long goodbyes for George Floyd and all the unrest in the country was, do you think the timing was right? Look, the president has acknowledged so many times, and rightfully so, the injustice with George Floyd. He was uh, upset when he... I mean, you know, this is just the most basic stuff. I mean, you could just, oh, you know, hey, I heard somewhere that maybe those cops were Klansmen. And that's why they attacked this frail old man. Like, anybody can do those games... It's disgusting that the president is doing it. It's disgusting. And, you know, they always slip these things in. His Twitter feed? What the fuck does his Twitter feed have to do anything? This old man could have been done nothing on Twitter for 10 years, but tweet out YouTube versions of the Ice-T song exclusively. There could be nothing else on his feed. Maybe... He loops in once every 30 tweets the NWA song. That would give grown men in riot gear the right to throw him on the ground and crack his head. This is, it's such an interesting thing to measure in the discourse. I mean, we talked about this yesterday with George Floyd. And of course, these people like this guy, the scumbag on the Daily Wire, I have no doubt that they would like to live in a world where George Floyd can be lied about and besmirched. And I always think of Giuliani, you know, he was no angel after the police, you know, torture or murder somebody. But it just isn't, you know, first of all, no human being is either bad or good. All human beings are complex and multifaceted. That's kind of the point. And secondly, it just doesn't matter. Like, yes, it's important to fully represent people as they are, but this old man could have said anything, could have done anything. We saw that clip of him posing absolutely no threat, being thrown on the ground, and having his head cracked open. That's it. That's it. They're making him sound pretty cool, actually. I'm going to go look up his Twitter feed now. She's like, I, I discovered the first time I listened to NWA, I was on a Sojourner Truth retreat at a monastery state new york yeah, you know what's gotta... bad you know what's bad when the young tpusa guys are replying to trump like sir the person who told you that this was okay to tweet out you is probably trying to sabotage you that was literally a uh, sort of kirk deputy tweeting at hmm. trump you know we got to respect our elders in the movement people are always dumping on boomers this guy is one of the good ones and i really hope he's okay yeah do we actually know is there any update on him um does anybody know uh, about that? Serious but stable was the last I had heard. But hey. Jesus Christ. That was just so between that um that young woman that the cops shoved and gave a concussion, the NYPD guy right by Barclays in the first day or two. Uh, of the uprisings and then that I mean you know there's been thousands of cases 
I mean, they uh, people have died. Absolutely, they've killed people. They've already killed more people in this uprising than the uh, extremely authoritarian Chinese cops have killed in Hong Kong. Which is, I'm pretty sure, none in Hong Kong. But that's a people debate. That's a debate. There's also <laughs> debates about you know deployment of other forces. Um, let's uh, see. Uh, but that being said, uh, we shouldn't, of course, be that concerned about a couple of cops in riot gear uh, cracking an old man's head open. What we have to be concerned about is that if police show weakness, we all know what will happen. The ever anxious, ever not so bright, Brian Kilmeade knows. And uh, hopefully other cities will realize when you give in, you show weakness and you will be steamrolled. You don't show kindness. Weakness leads to uh, absolute uh, abuse. And that's what we're seeing for seven blocks in Seattle. Unbelievable in an American city. You know, it's just incredible because there are endless examples of how... The police rioting, the police being vicious, the police being violent and out of control has, they've brought that energy. They've brought that energy. And there's no question that people whose efforts are, you know, interested in like policy solutions and community relations and all of this type of stuff are undermined and look, have absolutely no credibility um, because when cops go off like that. And this is also just the anxiety that defines all of these people. Like if you scratch underneath any authoritarian, it's pure anxiety. Oh, this guy's a fucking pussy. Excuse my language. But uh, this is the yeah, I think kind you of just attitude. demonetized the whole show. You said an F-bomb earlier. You broke the seal. I think, yeah, I, I did. I didn't say fucking pussy, though. That one is pro- That's probably a double whammy in the new YouTube censorship age. I mean, well, that being said, you've just done it. So criticizing Brian Kilmeade is a fucking pussy. Both. Sorry. Well, but, anyway. What did you say? Um, I said criticizing cops, cops is going to be worse than either of those. Yeah, right. that's right. You, you fascists uh, out there, you censors. But um, this is the kind of attitude that the cops also have. And this is why they react with so much brutality to things that seem relatively non-threatening, right? Because if they show weakness, they think, uh, you know, that's it. People are going to walk all over. They're going to disrespect them, right? Because they're big, giant babies. Um, this, this is why the cops can't be reformed. We just have to take away their power, take away their toys, take away their money, um, do layoffs by attrition, and ultimately have a world without them. Because this is the kind of attitude that they have, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna bend. We'll see. There's, it's a, it's a live debate right now, and we have to actually, you know, we have to mediate between all of these tendencies so things can actually be achieved also in the here and now. Um, let's go to clip number ten. Uh, this is very funny. Uh, Jamal Bowman. I haven't seen Matt Brendan. Have you guys seen any polls on this? I don't think there uh, is any polling. I don't know if there's any polling. I, you get the sense that this is a real race. Um, and there are some great candidates, I'll say, in New York uh, that I want to shout out. Isaiah James is a great candidate. Sam uh, 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 Lopez uh, is a great candidate. Uh, I like or I have interviewed Lauren Ashcroft a lot. Uh, Jamal Bowman. I think he might be in position here to take Elliot Angle out. We were talking earlier or yesterday about some of the different types of challenges between uh, how you uh, basically how, uh, you know, sort of left insurgent candidates are running and a major problem that still exists and won't be solved is until you have uh, candidates basically running on solid economic left agendas that can win in competitive districts and start to say what the blue dogs used to be able to say to the democratic leadership, which is like, look, we're winning in competitive districts. This district would go another way. If not for me, this is frankly, you know, this is something that Sherrod Brown can say. 
uh, as a senator from Ohio. And the fact that he outperforms Democrats in Ohio is very significant and something to learn from. But it does look like, and we have some records showing, of course, the most famous is AOC's great win over Joe Crowley, that serious challengers can take out machine Democrats in safe blue districts, possibly, which, you know, again, is not at all welcomed by House Democratic leadership. They would infinitely prefer the Joe Crowley's and Elliot Engels of the world to the Jamal Bowman's or ocasio Cortez's. Uh, and this is also why we need to pay very close attention to uh, Rashida Tlaib. There's a machine candidate with a lot of corporate backing that is challenging her, and it's very important to keep her in Congress. Uh, but this race is serious. Uh, Bowman uh, is, again, just a very impressive candidate. And Elliot Engel, even if he pulls this out, I mean, the anxiety he feels from finally being challenged. I mean, I don't think this, this guy definitely is acting like he's not had a competitive race in at least a decade, probably longer. 2000 was the last time he had a serious primary. Yes, that makes total sense. And of course, a couple of weeks ago, he was caught on, the, on Mike at a, at a George Floyd rally, basically saying like, hey, I need to get up here and speak. I wouldn't normally care but I've got a primary challenge. He said that twice. So this is Elliot Engel. And now he's going to try a very bizarre attack in this debate on Jamal Bowman. Uh, Jamal Bowman, of course, is a school principal in the district that he's seeking to unseat Engel in. Engel hasn't faced a real challenge since he was elected to the House in 2000. Check out this exchange. I'd like to ask Mr. Mr. Bowman, um, you know, where, where has he been? When we have community night outs every single year, we're fighting against flooding in Westchester. When we're fighting about, about crime or about anything in schools, um, where's he been? He's been his, with his school. And by the way, I hear that that school didn't have such good ratings. And I heard that the, the, the parents, the school made him resign because he was using his kids to do political campaign work for, for him. I heard that from a number of people. Pause so, you it. Know, people... I'm sorry, not to divert this here, and we will definitely play the rest of the clip. Elliot Engel sounds exactly like my impression of Sam. Like, exactly <laughs> like my impression of Sam. I was just thinking that. That's incredible. I, I heard that, that your school didn't rank very well. Okay, sorry, go ahead, play it. Sleeping glass houses should throw stones. So the, I, I think we got a question out of that, Mr. Bone. <laughs> that is completely absurd. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that last part of what he said was completely absurd. Um, so, uh, Congressman Engel, I, I haven't just served as a middle school principal, which I'm incredibly proud of. I didn't just open up my own public community school in the North Reeds Bronx, which is in your district. Uh, we, we did other things beyond the school. So we partnered with Montefiore Medical Center to build the health care attachment to the school. We're breaking ground on that this summer, and we're very proud of that. We've worked with the Alliance for Quality Education to increase funding for New York State schools uh, to record numbers. We worked for, uh, with the Coalition of Education Justice to bring culturally responsive uh, curriculum to our schools. We worked with one of your colleagues, Jamal Bailey, so he can fight for uh, trauma-informed schools on the Senate floor. And Jamal Bailey evoked my name on the Senate floor at the state level uh, when he pushed the bill to bring more trauma-informed uh, practices to our schools. Uh, I also testified uh, to the Governor Cuomo's Common Core Task Force against the Common Core Standards because they were developmentally inappropriate, and it led to a moratorium on entire teacher evaluations to uh, state tests. So, Congressman Engel, the reason why you, you've never seen me is because you're not here. You live in Maryland. I'm here. I'm principal of a district in your, uh, of a school in your district. And uh, you not seeing me says more about your absence than my absence. Okay. That uh, ends our cross-examination. Thank you, candidate. <laughs> wow. He just bodied him. That was awesome. That, ah! Also, he didn't even mention it. 
But he came up, uh, there was a great piece in Jacobin about Bill de Blasio and how self-styled liberal reformers relate to the grassroots. And it started with this piece. The piece started with this group of, of, uh, of activists and parents and educators who went to meet de Blasio to talk to him about Common Core and testing. And one of the things that's funny about the piece is like de Blasio actually has the right position on this stuff. Uh, generally, but still uh, essentially felt annoyed about meeting with community members uh, and meeting with educators that they should just like, you know, shut up and let him govern, even though, of course, he's got, let's just say, extremely limited leadership capacity. Anyways, one of the people uh, in the article that was mentioned uh, as a standout um, was Jamal Bowman as a principal, you know, uh, making the case so that's that's hysterical and you know there's i think there was another moment too where elliot engel also said something about a nurses union which has not endorsed him uh the only thing i've ever seen elliot engel actually be focused and on the ball about is carrying uh water for anything the israeli government wants to do anytime anywhere any place uh and a keen interest in a coup in Venezuela. And I will also say in the other district that Lopez is running in, it's really important to elect, I would say her uh, specifically, because uh, Sarno, the guy who's retiring, was actually a great congressman and did a lot of work as an example on U.S. interference in Latin America. So in this district, you have an opportunity for a huge upgrade and in Sarno's district, you have to uh, keep up standards, frankly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Serrano, has, excuse me. Has the, uh, the endorsement of the DSA, so it's pretty cool. I've been following her a little bit. Um, it is amazing just how lazy some of these people have gotten, just coasting on the power of being an incumbent and the Democratic Party establishment. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's still a toss-up. Like, the left might not have the institutional power to challenge these jerks but i mean it's good that they're trying and if if i want if i could talk about politics on the level of just like appearances and vibes for a minute because that's how a lot of people understand it um jamal bowman has what i would call a non-toxic masculinity about him that i think will be hopefully appealing to voters right masculinity gets bad rap people think oh you feminists you hate masculinity no non-toxic masculinity is good and it's fine because real men They do what he does. They listen to their students. They listen to the needs of the students and of the educators. And then they carry that message forward in like a really strong, cool way. So props to him. I think he's got enormous capacity uh, for for leadership. Um, I I think you're 100% right about that. I think he, yeah, he would be, he would be, a stunning improvement in that district. <laughs> like, um, so statues are coming down across the United States globally. Uh, slave traders, King Leopold, um, uh, author of Genocide in Congo. Um, it's really interesting to me because, of course, like, you know, of course, there shouldn't be monuments to terrorists and slave traders and, you know, the founder of the Klan or Christopher Columbus, for that matter. Uh, but the energy of the, how these are coming down is completely different now because it's in the context of material demands now. So it's in a whole architecture of what to do about policing, what to do about racism, what to do about violence, what to do about, uh, you know, the ongoing legacies um, of brutality, inequality uh, that still live out today versus just, uh, you know, a site of like historical context uh, or historical uh, fight. So the energy of it, to me today is very different and much more inspiring. I got an incredible uh, letter um, from a TMBS patron uh, 
basically about somebody's like, you know, personal connection to uh, the first statue that was ripped down uh, in Bristol in the UK. Uh, so there's a real um, context and energy for these uh, that are really dynamic and inspiring and important. So let's play a couple of clips here of, uh, I believe these are, are these activists from the American Indian movement? That's how it's yes. identified to me. Uh, AIM, which of course goes back to the late 60s, um, 70s, uh, taking down uh, Christopher Columbus statues. Uh, let's check them out. The hollow clang. Yeah. yeah. It was very anticlimactic. I love all the yeah. physics sort of like knowledge we're learning about how to like, you know, tie a rope high up on the statue um, just to use, you know, the physics of the to top of it. It's, you learn, we're learning a lot. Mm -hmm. It's like Angry we're Birds, in but in real life. educational phase. Is yeah. there another one? Oh, there okay, is. Beautiful. Nice. It's beautiful. You know, I used to think some of the discourse and concern around uh, statues might be. I don't know, not necessarily misplaced, but maybe not the most important thing because these are symbolic. These are symbols, right? But when I see a group of people, normal, working class, uh, many of them indigenous people, getting mad at a symbol of their hundreds of years long oppression and taking it down of their own volition, that's powerful. That's, 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 uh, that's what we need to see. That's, that's positive, that's constructive. It might be a symbol, but it's a symbol of some really real stuff. And it's also connected. I mean, it's connected to something that's happening right now. It's a whole sets of demands right this second. It's yeah. not, and it ends. People also in England happening. and the, I was just gonna say people in England and the American Indian movement. And it's all tied to this idea of priorities and funding and police. How we're gonna, you know, yeah, discipline it, ourselves. Yeah, exactly. How these changes are actually going to happen now, how the budgets are going to be redesigned and redeployed now. Like it isn't, you know, let's make this like an issue during the primary about, you know, because like we'll ask different Republican candidates, what do you think about the Confederate flag? And some will try to triangulate. And some will, you know, play the heart of white identity politics. It's not that those things aren't important and relevant, but they're not. They are symbolic and they aren't material and now in the context of everything that's happening they've been made both symbolic and material because they're create they're connected with this whole other set of of movement and demands and they're also you know they're happening uh mm -hmm. this isn't yeah. going through like a public hearing phase uh they're just coming down so yeah. it's really inspiring and awesome to see yeah that's but, what i was gonna say too like the people are doing it for themselves it's not like, oh, I'm going to write a letter to my congressperson and ask them what they think about this. No, like people are taking it upon themselves to do this stuff. And that's powerful. Now, Kaylee McEnany is going to get asked about bases named after a Confederate general. Now, this is going to be something really interesting to watch here. My understanding is, is it correct, guys, that Trump is doing a rally um, at the site of a massacre in Oklahoma. Yeah, a, right. What is the what is the information on that? Um, well, the I believe he's doing his Juneteenth rally at uh, the site of uh, the Tulsa massacre. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah, basically. Yeah. So he's going. So this is actually. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But I mean, this. Okay, this is. White House Press Secretary Kelly McEnany told reporters Thursday that President Donald Trump will resume, will resume campaign rallies on Juneteenth, a holiday marking the emancipation of slaves in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a city with a history of a racial massacre. 
She claimed Trump will share some of the progress that has been made for black Americans, but that the explanation, but the explanation is being rejected by many African-American leaders. <laughs> uh, the African-American community is very near and dear to his heart. And these rallies, he often shares the great work he has done for minority communities, said McEnany. Um, but given Trump's history of racist statements, including the birther movement, many instead see a call out to rally white supremacists. Uh, this isn't just a wink at white supremacy. He's throw, throwing them a welcome home party. This is Kamala Harris. So basically, um, and they go on to point out that, of course, he won't apologize uh, for the public role he played in the railroading of the five innocent teenagers that were the Central Park Five. He took out ads in the paper calling for giving them the death penalty. He still hasn't apologized. They've been completely exonerated. Their lives were ruined uh, because of this obscene systemic railroading of justice across the board. Donald Trump, the NYPD, all of the press, Mayor Koch. And just to uh, put a button on this, in 1921, Tulsa, I'm quoting you, was the site of a massacre of hundred, hundreds of African Americans during racial unrest in the historic section of the city known as the Black Wall Street. Once considered one of the most affluent and flourishing African American communities in the country, the District of Greenwood enjoyed more than 300 Black owned businesses, including luxury hotels, theaters, doctors, and pharmacists. Initial reports of the attack by a white mob, which looted and burned the businesses to the ground, says it took the lives of 36 people, but historians now believe as many as 300 died, according to the Tulsa Historical Society and Museum. How could this be seen? I mean, this is right in line with Ronald Reagan exactly. announcing his candidacy mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where uh, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, I believe the names are, I apologize if I'm not remembering them correctly, the uh, Freedom Riders uh, were murdered by uh, local police and Klan, essentially the same forces, the same forces in Mississippi. This is the same thing. And he's going to go out there. And by the way, I have no doubt. I think you might very well hear Donald Trump say Black Lives Matter. He'll say uh, some, you know, he will desecrate George Floyd's memory by even talking about him. He may even potentially mention the murder of Breonna Taylor, but make no mistake that the context of this speech is going to a historical massacre of African-Americans from 1921 that, as we said, was completely, uh, you know, after this genocidal act was underreported uh, in terms of the number of victims of this white mob. He's going to go there on the Juneteenth holiday. And even if he mentions this, I, I want to be really clear about this. He will mention George Floyd. He will talk about some of the legislative uh, things that he's done on criminal justice reform. He will honor Juneteenth. He may even mention this massacre, but it will not be anything systemic obviously and it will not be any type of full accounting or any type of real actual policy moving forward so and this is something that's just very important to watch with trump that like they're going to goad people because nothing could be more offensive and disgusting than the idea of him going and doing this on the juneteenth holiday they will pull out some stops that people aren't respect that people aren't expecting and the overall message and how they're signaling is going to be clear to who they're signaling to. Mm -hmm. Even as they will cry and be aggrieved that, you know, they're not getting proper credit. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah, this is a, a why would we even try don't respect by Stephen Miller, basically. Yep. Do you exactly. think Trump is going to try to go on some black media? As he attempts Definitely. to peel off a small percentage of the black vote, like 
Definitely. I would love to see him on like the breakfast club or something, just getting raked over the coals. He wouldn't do that one. Um, I don't think he would do the breakfast club. I don't think he would do. Um, the problem is finding the black media willing to be the platform for that. Well, I mean, look, there's always, I mean, conservative media has just like never ending money and infrastructure. So he will, you know, as a matter of fact, let's actually play clip number seven uh, because this is exactly the type of media uh, that Donald Trump will be doing. And of course, I say this as uh, I am no fan remotely of Don Lemon or Joy Reid uh, in the main. And this is, you know, where it gets difficult, uh, you know, in these conversations when we have to, you know, we have to keep pushing. We've got to read our Cornell West, read our Adolph Reed, read our Cedric Johnson and Torrey Reed so we can, you know, get the whole, um, you know, picture here um, in terms of, of dismantling these structures across the board. That being said, this clip, and this is, uh, this is Rainer Jackson, and he's speaking with, uh, at a White House meeting, and Donald Trump is going to love this absolute nonsense put on display and this is exactly um you know i don't know who rainer jackson is i'm assuming he has a platform uh there will be a whole infrastructure uh put in place uh for donald trump to go out and and make this play my name is Raynard Jackson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Daryl, for inviting us to this roundtable here. I'm from St. Louis originally, live here in, in Virginia. But what I'd like to say to you, Mr. President, it's kind of off the beaten path. I'd like to say to all the media assembled here that I wish they would quit lying about what you've done specifically for the black community. So you got radical liberal journalists like Joy Reid from MSNBC, Don Lemon from CNN, Roland Martin, who are putting more poison into the black community than any drug dealer, who are killing more black folks than any white person with a sheet over their face. How are they doing it? Spreading these lies about the economy you had, Mr. President, before the virus was a continuation of Obama. That's just factually not true. I have a degree in accounting. I keep up with the economy. They're lying. So to all these folks on MSNBC, CNN, Roland Martin, were you afraid to have real black Republicans who know what the hell they're talking about? If you want to know the truth, if you want us to dissect the Obama economy, let's do it. And I think, Mr. President, your record will win the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was incredible, Reynard. Thank you. Oh, accountant? Yeah, accountants. Wow, accountants. Is I usually account. I like accountants with skull caps who are Jews, but okay. Um, you know, I, look, I think that... Uh, and this was the bizarre, you know, double game that people who were promoting uh, Republican economics that would make every single problem worse from the perspective of all poor and working people had stuff to work with uh, in terms of, you know, the classic Trump formula of critiquing some aspects of, say, the Obama record from the left rhetorically and then coming in with you know, incredibly regressive supply side answers. I do think I was more concerned a couple of months ago and they were putting out very good ads and they clearly had a strategy going back to the Super Bowl um, where they put out one of the more effective ads they'd ever done uh, talking about the woman uh, that Trump had, had granted clemency to. I was much more worried about that because again, it's just, if they take a couple of percentage points from the black vote, they're good. They're in a great position for reelection. Or if you just depress the turnout, I think the last couple of months, uh, the last couple of weeks, that strategy has become a lot more difficult for a variety of reasons, including just that across the board, people are sick of this guy. They're exhausted. And there is that deep, normalcy seeking vote. And so I think these kind of games uh, have less potential than they did a couple of months ago. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, the other angle of this will continue to come from, you know, 
people from the left who are going to reject you know white supremacy supply side republicans but then also the uh you know chuck schumer dressing up as Jaffe jofer to suggest that he cares about different forms of systemic injustice in this country oh my god I mean, they're trying to do the same thing that Trump did with white voters, right? Which is to say, um, the Democrats are bad. The economy is a mess. We got some bad trade deals. Um, therefore, you should vote for me, right? It's it's mostly built on negative critique. It's built on exposing liberal hypocrisy, which is very real. But then the conclusion should not be to vote for Republicans. I just don't think that's going to work on most black voters for a variety of reasons. Um, I mean, we had a guy on recently to talk about how being a Democrat is an important part of black identity, right? And that has worked in good ways and bad ways. It worked in bad ways when we saw some older Southern black voters who did not vote for Bernie Sanders, partly because he was running against the Democratic establishment, Um, but it's good when it keeps uh, black voters from getting taken in by people like this. I would, uh, I would like to take Raynard up on for, to come explain what exactly Trump did differently from Obama for black people. Uh, that And what metrics exactly he's saying are so obvious that show a difference in Obama. Because basically all they do is show their favorite metric, which is unemployment, because it shows how well the labor is going in the country, basically. Right. And look at look at how look at how we're getting black people to work. I mean, it's really it's a the way that they talk about black unemployment is like, thank God we're getting them to go to work. That's that's like it's a double coded message to that's white exactly people. Right. And because yeah. they're still. Yeah, they're still dog whistling. I, I don't I actually, though, I really would put, you know, I want to be there is no monolith uh, again. Everybody really, really needs to read the anti-essentialist. Uh, writing. Um, there are, you know, the black population in the United States is larger than the entire population of Canada with radically different geographies, political traditions, and class positions. And of course, you know, it's not going to be, um, you know, and I, yes, people are going to see through the fraud of the Republican Party and the Republican Party's, you know, home in racism, in overt racism. Um, and also, uh, you know, people are going to need to to not, you know, the, the sort of standard Democratic Party MSNBC essentialist narrative is also absolutely, of course, not representing by any stretch of the imagination all of the interests, uh, class positions and political traditions of, of, of black politics in this country. And that is, you know, rhetorically, and I'm seeing that Raynard Jackson is a Republican political consultant who has served on the presidential campaigns of both Bush Jr. and Sr., um, there will be that rhetorical opening for the right as long as the substantive policies uh, of the Democratic Party are, are, are bad. And as long as there's that, you know, entitled essentialism uh, as well. Um, there let's is take, a long I, black radical tradition. Well, there's the also, country, there's just many black political, the there's multiple black political traditions. I think that's, you know, really, again, it just needs to be spoken about with the same complexity and accuracy of, of anything else. Um, and there's a huge problem in the rhetorical deployment of erasing any aspect of that from the erased and attacked radical tradition, but also like, you know, older uh, and younger, more conservative voters, just like any other block of voters. Uh, there's nothing, you know, uh, essentialist about any group. Um, this is Steve Mnuchin, who has the over $4 trillion uh, slush fund, essentially, at his disposal, who, uh, again, Kamala Harris had an opportunity to prosecute him in California. She did not. And here he is as Treasury Secretary. But look into Steve Mnuchin's history in the housing market, his history in foreclosures. Look at his own inheritance of power. He's another trust fund baby. Um, He's overseeing the slush fund. He's talking about, uh, obviously, he's not going to be transparent about it. That would be a violation. We talked about that earlier. 
Uh, and he's coming through to suggest <laughs> there's a lot we still don't know about Corona, obviously. And of course, even if you're outside, you can absolutely get it. That's why you should be wearing masks. That's why you should be maintaining uh, six feet of uh, distance from other people. But it is one of the only things that we could say with some certainty is that you are at a lower likelihood of transmission outside versus inside. That's something that's kind of broadly understood by basically everybody, except apparently the Treasury Secretary, too busy funneling money into corporate America to keep up with the basics of the transmission of the pandemic that has caused a Great Depression, which he is, well, he's actually doing a lot about under his watch. He's doing it to, as a massive grand theft for the ultra wealthy of this country. Let me just give a pitch on indoor seating, okay? I'm happy that in DC, they've now allowed restaurants open. I've tried to support restaurants. I don't see why on an indoor basis, socially distanced, mm -hmm. that restaurants can't be serving indoors, particularly in parts of the country where COVID is under control. So I agree with you. This distinction between indoor and outdoor seems a bit, uh, a bit random, and I don't know what people would do when it rains. Thank you. Well, it's not random. It's that it is quite literally safer outdoors than indoors. It's how air so, circulates. It's how air circulates. It's why every single thing that we have seen about this has said that if you're in any type of contained or stagnant environment, you are more at risk of this. Like literally everybody knows that. Also, what part of the country is this completely under control in? Exactly. That was my thought. Like everywhere that said they had it under control is reopening and, you know, having their largest outbreak of cases and hospitalizations as we speak. Hey, like, isn't they, that happening right now? Aren't there spiking cases across the country? Like yes. even in the last yeah. couple of days, Phoenix correlated clearly with openings. And of course, of course, these assholes are going to blame it on the protests. And absolutely. Look, of course, there's going to be a spike because of some of the protests. We can't, you know, don't deny the reality. Obviously, there will be. The but that is not, that is not. This was already in the works, and we had already seen the numbers coming in because of the reopening. So what, what is he talking about? It's this mass denial of basic reality right now from the White yeah. House and from governors. Like, just, oh, no, it's done. It's, it's done. It's an end it's an end in and of itself, regardless of the specific thing they're denying. Because like, as long as they have people, then you can be like, well, who knows anything? That's, that's the sentiment they want to cultivate. And like any specific instance that they're wrong about, they don't really care if they get busted on being wrong about that because they know that a certain number of the population is going to just throw their hands up and be like, yeah, we can't trust experts anymore. Well, they did remove one of the refrigerated truck morgues from the hospital near my house, so... That's progress. There's still one there, but, you know, one less. I mean, to the extent there is, like, if New York is in a position where it's lessening, it is because the response has been so utterly catastrophic that maybe between, like, lack of reports, people, you know, dying from this, but we don't have it assigned that way, like half of New York City could have already gone through this, basically. So, like, when Cuomo talks about crushing the curb, I mean, basically, like, if New York is ahead, and there's no real proof of that, like, I, I would still expect to see a second surge of this everywhere, um, you know, later in the year. But, like, if, if New York basically New York being under control is like, quote unquote, is, I mean, first of all, it's just not. But secondly, it's basically because it was so completely recklessly handled that it's informally we've run, like we did the UK model here, right? Like there's, you know, there isn't herd immunity. You still have to take all these precautions, but a ton of people have had ton maybe half the population yeah 
we probably didn't... not that much, but I'm just like, it's, it's in, and even here, it is not under control. <laughs> like yeah. it's still, people are still getting it all over yeah. the place. We didn't quite do what that right wing libertarian was advocating on CNBC. I forget his name where he's like, just don't do anything. Let it rip through the population. It's like ripping off a band aid. But we did sort of a lesser version of that in many places where insufficient measures were taken. That's right. Um, now, let's uh, let's actually let's just do uh, before we wrap up. Let's just do a little bit of a palate cleanser. Um, I don't know. I I keep saying I'm almost bored with making fun of Dave Rubin at this point, but it's still brings people a lot of joy so let's share some joy also uh the prediction markets on this have been high for a long time that uh you know dave rubin whose whole original thing uh was apparently that he was upset about uh how the um the young turks treated sam harris dude that was a lot of money and religious people Yes, but now we are not talking about uh, atheism and secularism anymore. Now, Dave is putting on his religious cap. Fairly obvious to me over the last couple of years, you know, speaking to many of the people who you've talked to from Sam Harris and Steven Pinker and Michael Shermer and Jordan Peterson and the rest. Um, that there has to be empirical truths outside of us that set order in the universe. One of the reasons we're seeing such chaos out of the left is that secularism run rampant. It gives you what the left is. It gives you people with a completely competing set of ideas, often that have nothing to do with reality, just based on how they feel at any moment. And the reason they're constantly destroying each other is because, well, okay, I feel $15 minimum wage is right, so I'm morally good. Then the next person comes and says the $20 thing, and then they're morally good. Now you gotta cut them down, and there's a million versions of this we could go through. The founders of the United States talked about God-given rights. The United States, does not make me free. I was born free. You are born free as a human being, whether you want to call it a God-given right or it's your, it's your birthright as a human being. The, the government can protect if your you're a slave. rights. It should protect your rights. And it can take those rights away. But it, doesn't, it did not make me free. And the only, the real reason that I came around to this, <laughs> um, which I know is very much in line with, with what you believe and it's very much, certainly in line with what Jordan believes. Ben Shapiro is that it's the only thing that over generations has allowed us to set some sort of order to the bad ideas of the day. So when there's a certain set of crew, the, the liberals of today, let's say, who all believe it all happened at the Enlightenment. And it's like, yeah, a lot of great ideas happened from the Enlightenment, right? Free thought and open inquiry. And a lot of the stuff that I talk about all the time about the individual, although you in, in your last book, you talk about how the roots of that also came from Greek culture and from, uh, from Jerusalem. But the point is that, that there is an, it took churning of ideas for thousands of years to get to the Enlightenment. So to say it all started there it strikes me as very thin. And when we live in a time right now where postmodernism is so hot and the ideas, that, the, the, the time-tested bad ideas of the past, of socialism and communism, somehow are becoming cool again, it seems to me that the secular world has no way of countering it. That's why liberalism has been decimated by the progressives. Mm. Uh, I'd actually, I gotta say, order a copy of Against the Web, Cosmopolitan Answer to the New Right, where we talk about uh, the global roots of, as an example, a notion of human rights, that uh, not only that aspirations are universal and generated in multiple contexts, as an example. I, I don't know what to say. I mean, Dave Rubin still insists on talking about things as if he's able to talk about them. And I guess it's still pretty funny. Uh, I mean, I got to say, if Sam Harris, Steve Pinker, and Michael Shermer were the representatives of secularism to me, I would be uh, Muslim. Uh, just practicing absolutely. Orthodox okay, Muslim That's right totally now. right. Yeah, yeah. Those guys are enough to make anyone. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. 
I Religious think if, people are better than those guys for sure. Oh, yeah. I think if we review the tapes, I said Dave Rubin's got maybe about a year before he turns into a Jew for Jesus because uh, he's hanging out with so many of those types. I remember that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If it, it, being a Jew for Jesus might be the only way of, of controlling the ideas that are bad. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of ideas that a Jew for Jesus can counter. Yeah. And I talk about them as ideas that are good from, you know, the enlightenment and whatnot. But if you're a Jew for Jesus, then somehow it isn't cool to do that. Just- also, like, I like, now it's like he's conflated. Like, now it's like, I mean, of course, he's going to confuse Marxism and postmodernism because that's like the, the Jordan that's Peterson the shtick. Yeah. But like now it's like there's a problem with the Enlightenment. <laughs> and somehow that like he's now he's, he's so actually legitimately taking three. He's having things. a breakdown. He's yeah, taking he's... three. Like those are really discreet. Like, right. <laughs> Marxism as the fulfillment, the making the Enlightenment some substantive. Right. Mm-hmm. In a way. Then there's yeah. like postmodernism questioning meta narratives which would implicate the enlightenment and marxism <laughs> like you know and, and it's not to say look there are people look i definitely meet people who say they're marxists or whatever and i'm like okay that doesn't totally sound like that to me but whatever the point is is like dave talking about these things as if he could even make it through a wikipedia entry i guess <laughs> in 2020 even with everything going on and even as much as it's sort of a dead topic it's still pretty funny. Because yeah, he's an I mean, absolute moron. It's yeah, like man. it seems like Dave Rubin to me. It just like when he talks, I'm like, I feel like a core curriculum, like teaching assistant at a college, and I'm like, why don't you just pick one, stick with that, and we'll see <laughs> the next draft. Basically. <laughs> How about you talk about why being a Jew for Jesus solves the problem of the Enlightenment? Look, and we'll take just- postmodernism and Marxism next time. In terms of a business proposition, the, the second that he stops, you know, getting t- teenage and 20 year old YouTube subs, making the pivot to like a religious grifter is probably going to be the best business sense he can do. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, Absolutely. these guys like like Prager, you know, yeah. knows his Torah a little bit. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> you know, this actually is good proof for people who talk about religion in such a simplistic way that like. Whatever you think of religion, it actually does require more to talk about it publicly than just be like, religion's good. I just want feudalist. Like the enlightenment. I want feudalist Dave Rubin who's like, you know, we were able to contain ideas a lot better back then. We had like drawbridges. <laughs> keep the ideas out. Keep them out. There was moat that kept the bad <laughs> ideas away. You know, he's not that many degrees separated from the uh, dark enlightenment people, so... You never know. Some of these people, they want to make feudalism great again. Absolutely. Feudalist Dave Rubin. I was like writing down notes when he was talking about um, enlightenment principles and my critique of the bourgeois concept of natural rights. And then I'm like, what am I doing? I can't I can't argue with this person. It's like arguing with a child. Like his points don't make any sense. Folks, I yeah, I, I, that yeah, would be very uh, interesting. One more. I got one more clip that we could play that just dropped about an hour ago and is a big breaking news for uh, the MAGA world. All right. Final clip of the day. Breaking news from Brendan. June 14th just happened. Love our voters. Love our country. Our great voters. That thing had three engines. Can you go back? Three motors. Oh, 
sound that shot or anything, but okay. Jesus, I like it. He says from the yachting lifestyle, many locations. Oh. They're all in Florida. Oh. Florida, Alabama, Cali, South Carolina. Mostly Florida. I mean, if he's in trouble in Florida, he is fucked. Just another right. plug. For, I just want to give a quick plug for uh, the Literary Hangover Twitch channel if you want to see boats being sunk over the next couple of weeks in uh, Assassin's Creed Rogue. <laughs> All right, everybody. We're back tomorrow. Uh, take care. Stay strong. Stay safe. Thanks, everybody. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught But see the truth in the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know